I'm Laura Vinroot Poole. For over 20 years, I've owned Capital, an internationally recognized specialty store in Charlotte, North Carolina. On this podcast, we unlock the stories of people's lives through the stories of what they wore. These aren't conversations about fashion. These are conversations about people. Jane Pendry and I have become dear friends over the past few years. She visits our stores twice a year to show her beautiful collection, Dovima. We sat down together to talk about exactly how she arrived at this moment and what strikes me as a fashion fairy tale. Jane has worked everywhere from British Vogue, Women's Wear Daily, Laura Ashley, Givenchy, and finally Yves Saint Laurent before starting her own collection. Jane Pendry. Welcome. Welcome to Charlotte for the millionth time. (laughs) (laughs) It's delightful to be here. Always, always, always. Oh, we love having you and everybody just looks forward to having you come. Um, I'm always so happy to come. I really am. Thank you. Your travel schedule to do these trunk shows are interesting because you really have insight into all the stores in in the country. Well... You, you were the first store, Capital was the first store where I ever did it in a store. Mostly you did it I in was home? Private homes really? and then hotel suites. Mm-hmm. And still, on the whole, it's mostly like that. And if anything, when I was showing in LA, it was a friend's showroom, which a home furnishing showroom, so it right. was more like a home. Mm-hmm. So Capital was really the first. And now there's four stores, so still out of nine. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah. how do you, and how do you find Southern clients? Southern. I love the South. <laughs> I absolutely have developed a huge passion <laughs> and love for the South, and um, which was not a place... I didn't know the South before I started doing this, and that's what's been so fun about doing these trunk shows, is it's got me to parts of America that I would never have been to before. Mm-hmm. And I always try and treat every single season I do as a kind of adventure. Yeah. So your, if, your itinerary is never the same, or is it? I try to make it different each time yeah. in order, A, to keep me amused, right. plus I really want to, you know, go and discover somewhere new and different, and, you know, that's what makes it fun yeah. kind of thing. And I think it makes it fun for everybody, but also for myself, yes. selfishly, but I think that's important. You do something that I do also. Uh, you always go to a museum or go try to figure if I, something not clothing <laughs> related. Yes. But if I, I think possibly I really can. Yeah, yeah. For me in market, it's it's just so much visual stimulation that I, I just need a palate cleanser. I have to take a break and just look at churches or something. <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. And it also seems a huge pity for me to go to somewhere that maybe I'm only going there once. Yeah. Maybe I'm never going back. Everywhere has got something special, interesting about it. I want to find out what that is and get there. Yeah. And if it means sort of somehow getting up at seven o'clock in the morning I'm not going to say six because that's a little (laughs) enthusiastic but you know I will go and I will see and I will find it and I I have seen such amazing beautiful wonderful things and where where are you from I am English (laughs) born in Japan really and I lived there until I was about two and a half three and then we moved back to England and so grew up in basically in London and between London and the countryside but I went I was lucky enough to be sent to the French Lycée in London mm. which is thanks to that wine now I'm married to a lovely Frenchman <laughs> and live in Paris yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'm now getting to the point where I think I've probably spent as much time living in Paris as I did growing up in London I'm reaching that point where it's almost as much time 50, between 50. the two. Yeah, 50, 50. And tell me about style as a girl and, and style growing up I in think London. So England had been through that whole, you know, 60s style thing, mm-hmm. which was kind of quite exciting, but I was a small child while that was going on. But my mother was fantastically stylish, very beautiful, an artist. Are you an only child? I, I, I have a very complicated family. I'm actually <laughs> the eldest of nine. What? But I'm also an only child. Right, you're so the only was, of that couple. I'm the only of that couple, <laughs> but I'm the eldest of nine. So wow. you need a whiteboard and two hours to but figure this out. But that's the first uh, union. So, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, but I actually grew up really all through my young childhood with sisters. So okay. From who? Your mother? 
No, <laughs> my stepfather. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was a real 60s thing <laughs> of, you know, everybody getting together, divorcing. <laughs> but where I have to say all my parents, be they biological or steps, were really fantastic, oh. were their attitude was that it it was not about the kids. It wasn't all this mess was nothing to do with them. And whoever it was would just scoop up this kind of tribe huh. of children and take them on holiday and that kind of thing. So we always grew up as a, a tribe. And this kind of carried That's on and so on and on. That's so interesting, yeah. So don't, people don't do that anymore. So it's not about us. Right. And it's true. It wasn't yeah, about us. Right. It's <laughs> like, you know, they were doing whatever they were doing. Yeah. And so that was really lovely. So that's why huh. I'm an only, but I'm the oldest of nine. <laughs> Tell me what you wore. What? what, um, what so where, did, where were you in school? So I was at school in London at the Lycée Francais. Right. And the reason I went there is my biological father is a naturalized Canadian. Ah. And he ended up spending time in Canada. And he said that he wanted his daughter to be able to read both sides of the cereal packet. <laughs> because in Canada, it's in both yeah. languages. <laughs> so that was how the Lycée happened in London. Is he French-Canadian? No, no, he just it was no, just no, the no. packet. Yes. And the <laughs> the thing that was funny is not one other person in my family speaks a word of French. That's so funny. I know. So and were I, there uniforms at the lycée? No, there uh. weren't. I started off at one school actually before I went there where we did have uniforms, but it wasn't long enough to make a difference. Right. So it was the French lycée thing. Mm -hmm. What's nice about the lycée is that it's a school which is a huge mixture in terms of people's backgrounds. Right. They're as kind of open, so you get f French kids who are the kids of waiters and the children of ambassadors, or their father's the president of a big, you know, multinational. And all this kind of mixed together. And that was always really sort of fantastic, and it was in the centre of London. But my first memories of fashion were not so much to do with school, were more to do with... There was this store in London called Bieber. Yes. And I remember being taken there as a small child. I mean, really small child. And with being your mom? With my mum, because I think she wore the clothes as well. Uh -huh. And her buying me this outfit, which to this day, I can remember. <laughs> exactly the colour. Oh my God, it was so fantastic. <laughs> it was a maxi dress, as they called it at the time. I think I must have been eight. I mean, seriously. Oh my God. Long. It was a sort of Swedish blue with chrome kind of yellow dots. It was like a sort of mini oh, cat thing in a cotton gauze with a tie at the neck. It was very wafty and floaty. Oh, and there's and colours on you. The colours were Gorgeous. fantastic. And I was also bought a floppy hat. Oh my God. And I thought I was <laughs> the bee's knees. I mean, just <laughs> the coolest. What would you, would you wear clogs with that? Or what would you wear with that? Boots? I can't even remember what went on my feet. I was so about the hat and the dress. <laughs> I mean, it was like, just barefoot. Who cares? No, I think we had little leather sandals okay. actually, but that was oh. the best thing. And the, and then a little while after that, so I, I was a Bieber fan. It was yeah. like anything oh but Bieber. And then I got. They used to make these little t-shirt dresses with a sort of swoopy sleeve. You know that sort of great kind of you know flared look. Uh in purple oh it, was all, it was so <laughs> exciting I mean it was just fantastic and then Bieber moved from their sort of clothing store to this they took over a department store in High Street Kensington which had been very old fashioned and they redid it top to toe yeah and it was really the first lifestyle retailing that anybody had ever done anywhere ever wow and it was a fantasy and it was and just all the people that worked there were incredible all the Gorgeous. people were amazing looking, but you walked in and so Barbara Huliniki, who was the designer behind it, was very inspired by the sort of 30s Art Deco thing. And it was all sort of brown mirrors and this sort of 30s Deco thing. And she launched makeup and she yeah. launched the food halls downstairs. So dog food was in a dog, believe it or not. There was a huge model of a dog that had shelves in it and that was where the dog food was. Oh. The There was a vast can of Heinz baked beans, which probably doesn't mean anything no, it to does. your English, <laughs> with the uh, label cut out, shelves, and all the cans of Heinz baked beans. I mean, it was magical, magical, magical. Wow. She's still alive, isn't she? She is. I yeah. believe she's in Miami. Uh, yes, I think like you're that. right. Yes, yes, and she's doing a hotel there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's been a few years. The lingerie. 
was a circular bed covered in leopard print oh with knickers and bras sort of strewn <laughs> across the bread. I mean, everything. It was coat, you know, those sort of coat play things. And that was, they just loaded dresses on it and did it like that. Boots, those fabulous lace-up suede boots uh. in every colour of the rainbow just lined up on the floor. I mean, you just wanted to sort of roll around in it all. and I mean, <laughs> Like a fever dream, it um, sounds it like. Was, it was so fantastic. What, tell me about your mum. She was a Bieber girl, but what, what did she... Not just, actually. She was really beautiful. Yeah. Really, really beautiful. She was just very stylish, actually. So she did the Bieber thing. She did a sort of neater 60s thing. Uh-huh. I think there are often little jackets in my collection yeah. that are sort of channeling my mum, which are sort of like those slightly sort of 60s high up under the armhole, neat little jackets. Things well, like I'm also that. thinking of that Biba dress, the T-shirt dress you were talking about with the flared sleeve. I'm thinking of your blouse. Oh, OK. Yes. <laughs> I think there are a lot of influences. Well, yeah. <laughs> and then you finished at the Lycée and then... What I did you do after finished that? at the Lycée and I actually got into college but went to went to Paris for a weekend with a boyfriend for a long weekend mm-hmm. and stayed for two years. Which was kind of fun. And the minute you landed you were like this no, is it. No, 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 no. It was it was I didn't think I thought, well maybe I'll stay on a bit. Because, you know, I had the rest of the summer. I actually got a job very quickly as being a nanny. Uh For a French family? For a French lady, which actually was a complete nightmare. She, after two days, leapt from the other end of the kitchen and stuck her tongue down my throat. What? I know, it was really kind of shocking. (laughs) And I ran out of her apartment. (laughs) Leaving behind my coat, my handbag, my metro tickets, the whole thing. I mean, it was really like, oh, my goodness, what just happened? Kind of thing. And this is before mobile telephones, before all of that. So I had to walk across Paris and I sat on the steps of a friend's apartment in floods of tears waiting for him to come home. Because because I I didn't have any money on me. I didn't have a metro ticket. I didn't have anything, 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 anything. Uh. So that was kind of quite funny. So, you know, that was an amusing story. But so he went round to get all that. So that was done and finished. But thankfully, within about 48 hours, I'd actually got a summer job at Women's Wear Daily. Yes. And so that was where really it all started after this rather unfortunate (laughs) two, three day interlude. Harassment. (laughs) Harassment kind of thing. Oh my God. That I I love hearing your stories about Women's Wear Daily. Oh, I know. And and Patrick was your boss. He was. He recently died. I wanted to ask you about it. He's a really was a really lovely man. So the Women's Wear Daily offices were on Rue Cambon, opposite the back entrance of the Ritz, next to Chanel. Right. Under the eaves. Okay. It did not seem that swanky. <laughs> but it was a really important kind of newspaper. I was 18 years old. I did not know the first thing about anything. Probably turned up in a Laura Ashley dress or something, <laughs> you know, which was a little passe exactly. at that point. <laughs> because I could speak French, because I'd been sort mm. of recommended... I got the job as the office assistant and I just started suddenly going to fashion shows and things that women's wear at the time used to do called advances. So before the shows, women's wear and W would go to all the houses to and there'd be a model dressed who we would either photograph in the salon or take out into the street. So I started doing this and it was a very sort of speedy education and because it was a newspaper Everything was filed the following day, and it was written up. And so Patrick was a great journalist. There were other really good journalists. My job was to use the telex machine. I'm really (laughs) aging myself here. Um, Which looked like a cathedral organ (laughs) and and sort of made a sort of clackety-clack noise. And I'd have to type in all of their stories, and then we'd feed it through on tape because, of course, it cost a fortune for this to the more the longer you left it open it was like a very very expensive uh, phone call right and sort of feed it through and we'd do all that and it was I mean it was really really funny but we'd be filing until midnight uh-huh. Paris time was deadline deadline because that was 6 p.m 
New York Times, and that's okay. when they closed the presses in New York. Huh. So for a newspaper that was going to appear the following day, wow. it was great. But the photographs could not appear in the following day's newspaper. So you could get the telex to send the story, but the photographs would appear the day after that because there were no yet fax machines or any way of transmitting an image. It was still rolls of film. And so how did you get the rolls of film? So the rolls of film the had Concord? to go on the Concord. No, are you kidding? Seriously. And so that was always really fun. <laughs> there were these red bags that we'd get the rolls of film that were either developed, not de developed with the little, you know, choices and that kind of thing, but often not even developed. I would run downstairs. I would go through the Ritz. There would be, we would grab one of the limousines <laughs> for the Ritz and it would take me to the airport, to the customs area, and I would give them the bag to put on Concord. In between time, there'd often been ca calls from John Fairchild saying, on your way to the airport, can you go by El Olivier and buy me a few bottles of olive oil? <laughs> or I really need some shampoo from this French. No! <laughs> and they would go in, in the red bag. The red bag. Oh, my and God. put on the 11 a.m. Concord <laughs> for New York. I mean, <laughs> those are the days kind of thing. And Patrick was really, really funny because he took all of this, he found the whole thing really amusing. So very quickly, I started going out at night and having a great time yeah. and you know, clubs, it was the days of the palace and the privilege and it was, you know, lots of friends and I would actually turn up for work basically still wearing the dress right. that I'd been wearing the night before with mascara and makeup <laughs> down my face. And you're 18 years old. I was 18, 19 yeah. years old. And Patrick would put me in a chair in front of his desk, make me a cup of coffee, <laughs> put his hand on his ha um, in his hand and go, now tell me everything. everything. <laughs> <laughs> Who did you see last night? What <laughs> happened? Da, da, da. And then he'd say, go home, have a shower, and be back by one o'clock when New York wakes up. Uh, when New York wakes up. I love it. <laughs> yeah. oh, what an incredible first mentor to have. He was wonderful. And I very quickly decided that I wanted to write. I wanted uh -huh. to do like everybody else. So he said, okay, you're going to write parallel stories or you're just go you're going to find subjects to write stories about and I'll edit them. And he did. And, you know, I'd get the copy back and big red <laughs> slashes through the thing. But, you know, that's you know, how it works. Yeah. And he, you know, taught me to write a caption, the whole thing. One of the things I love, the stories I love, is you're working on the in, what's in and what's out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, yes, that one was really good. Yes, so W had an in and out list which appeared every year around Christmas, I think. Uh -huh. And the way we'd have to send a list from Paris of what we thought was in and out. And the way that we'd do that would everybody would be in what actually these tiny offices, kind of with our feet up on the thing, we'd get in about five bottles of champagne, get <laughs> roaring drunk. <laughs> And just kind of decide what was in and out. And it could be as random as... Barrettes. Gala soap is in. <laughs> you know, why? We don't know. But the famous time about that was we decided that Giorgio Armani was out. And Giorgio Armani oh, happened God. to be one of the most major it, advertisers. The, right, this is for the both 80s, w right? Yes. Yeah. No, 90s. <laughs> okay. For WWD and W. And the newspaper appeared and <laughs> surprisingly they pulled all of their advertising that did not go um, over well and the funny thing is is that it's not like we put this in the newspaper we put this on the list right because we hadn't liked the shows right. the list went to new york john fairchild <laughs> loved people being naughty yeah so he loved the idea of this and so it appeared in the newspaper <laughs> And, of course, they pulled their advertising. Oh and so there then had to be a certain amount of on knees, cap in hand, <laughs> going back to Giorgio Armani, going, we're so sorry, <laughs> it was a typo kind of thing. I mean, I don't know quite how they explained it. We have a 19-year-old typist. <laughs> yeah, it was just like, oh, my God. But I, let's be honest, it was out. <laughs> it was. It was really It out. was definitely really, really, really out. But the, and we also then made the front page of the New York Times the Herald Tribune, we, the thing was written about is Newsweek, the office was besieged by other journalists because I don't think anything had ever quite happened like this before. Mm. Well, I mean, now with social media, you know, everybody's all over it in right. a nanosecond. Mm. 
So this was, you know, appeared in the magazine and Giorgio Armani pulls their advertising. This was front page news for <laughs> the New York story. Times. This yeah. was a story. <laughs> so we were besieged. And I, there was I <laughs> going, no comment, no comment into the telephones and putting them down and locking the doors of the office. I mean, it was just insane. The whole thing it was very funny. It was very funny. I love that. <laughs> and then after that. How, where'd you go next? I moved back to England. I was going to move to New York to be a journalist, uh-huh. but my mum was sick, and so I decided I want to move back to England to be with her. And so I got a job at British Vogue, uh-huh. which was wonderful, completely different, yeah. because this was suddenly about the visual and the image and being a stylist and uh-huh. that. One of my favourites was this editor called Sheila Wetton, mm. who looked like the Duchess of Devonshire, completely white hair, sparkly blue eyes, came to work every day. I mean, she must have been late 60s. Beautiful, really, really beautiful. Came to work every single day wearing a long tweed skirt, brown lace-up brogues, a twin set and pearls. Oh, I mean, fabulous. perfection. Yeah. She said a swear word, <laughs> every other word. I have <laughs> never ever in my life met somebody with a fouler mouth than that woman. It was extraordinary. And I promise you, it was effing this. Did you see the effing coming out of this woman? I promise you, who was just extraordinary looking. I mean, so it was full of wonderful, fun characters. But I mean, it, still people that I'm friends with who are assistants with me. Lucinda Chambers yeah. was an assistant at the same time. She went on to be the fashion director of British Vogue. She's now launched this fantastic collection. You know, really fun people who I sort of kept in touch with. But incredibly good training. I yeah. mean, you know, Vogue is a very good finishing school. Yeah. So from Vogue, did you move sp- straight from Vogue into working for houses? No, I didn't. Grace, as Grace Codrington, as far as I'm concerned, is actually one of the most incredible stylists who has ever been. She is. And it was that thing of watching Grace work and watching what Grace did and deciding that I was a good stylist, but I didn't care about it as much as she obviously did. Mm. And so I projected myself of, do I want to do this for the next 30 years? And the answer was no. Mm. There was that I loved it, I was very good at it, but I was never going to be a truly spectacular, memorable, shake-the-world stylist, so maybe it was time to do something else. Mm. And actually, I moved over to work for Laura Ashley, (sighs) designing home furnishings, if you can believe it. (laughs) (laughs) So this is back in the day when Laura Ashley was really a wonderful brand. Oh, yeah. Listen, my entire room at my parents' house is still full of Laura Ashley. Laura Ashley, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) So I was hired by Mrs. Ashley. In the time that it took to leave Vogue and start at Laura's, she had had an accident and died, and the company had gone public. The way I originally got in was I was, I met Nick Ashley, Mm -hmm. who had asked me to come and work as a PR on the fashion side, because going to a journalist to be a PR felt like the natural thing to do. And I very cheekily said to Nick, (laughs) I'd much rather do home furnished things, because we can't really call it fashion, can we? (laughs) <laughs> at the time which was and he said no I guess you're right had you always been into interiors I yes because my yeah. mother had, yeah. we, we constantly I lived in building sites my entire childhood <laughs> which was always our house which seemed to be in a constant state of redecoration yeah. or it was another house or something like that so I'm yes to an architect I understand yes right. exactly <laughs> so it was that kind of thing so I did the, the PRE thing for about nine months Hated being. I thought you were nine minutes. But no, yeah. no, 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 <laughs> nine months. But absolutely, really hated it. Yes. Got headhunted to go and do it somewhere else, and turned around to Nick and said, "I love this company, but I hate being a PR. Please, can I do something else?" Mm-hmm. And he said, "Give me twenty-four hours." Called me back twenty-four hours later. He said, "Okay, do you want to design the home furnishings, <laughs> or do you want to art direct the home furnishings catalog?" And I said. Give me 24 hours and I'll get back to you. And I so thought, what did you do? Go home and freak out? And I like... went out and freaked out <laughs> completely. Uh, but then thought, actually, I'd really love to start designing home furnishings. And did you have any, I mean, what hubris? What, did you have any idea what, how that worked? What was fantastic about Laura Ashley, and I think they've got a point, they hired people who understood the brand DNA. That was what they got. If they figured that you really 
got the brand, mm -hmm. they reckoned if you were asked to design a glass and make it Laura Ashley, you would know what that piece looked like. Mm. And they actually kind of had a point. Yeah, they so did. I knew nothing about how a plate was made or how sheets were made or how, you know, I just didn't know anything about mm -hmm. that stuff. But I did know what it should look like if it was going to be made by Laura Ashley mm -hmm. and for Laura Ashley. So that was the fun thing. Yeah. And they were this company, they threw so much responsibility at incredibly young people mm -hmm. and just go off and do it. And we were suddenly doing this whole big project called Laura Ashley Home and another one um, that I had really great fun with called Mother and Child that became a standalone concept. I think I was 26 or 27 when I was doing this. And you just kind of kept going. If you could handle it, they'd give you more, more responsibility. <laughs> but I ended up going to factories, and I loved going to factories. Was that had never happened England? to me before. Yes, on the whole, everything was huh. made in England. I, that's when I started spending a lot of time in New York, because the only thing that was a licensed product was the sheets hmm. made by a in company North called... Yes. Yeah, West Point Pepperell. Or yes, yeah. J.P. Stevens. J.P. Stevens, yeah. So that was one of my most magical factory visits ever. Huh. We had to take, so by J.P. Stevens, we had to take a private plane to somewhere. I think it was probably Burlington. in North Carolina. It was North, North Carolina. Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> we landed. We drove through cotton field after cotton field after cotton field, get to this mill that sat in the cotton field where the cotton went in at one end, was made into thread, was then woven into towels. It was just for towels, mm. this thing. And then there was a conveyor belt that then went over to the other half of the mill that did the dyeing and the bleaching, and then it went straight into trucks. Right. And watching this whole process. But the other thing that was really sweet was, you know those boards with the little holes where they put, you know, welcome, blah, blah, blah. Right. I walked in and it said, welcome, Laura. They thought I was Laura. Oh my gosh, Jane. <laughs> oh, I love that. I know. And I couldn't, I would have cried my I eyes couldn't out. tell them otherwise. <laughs> and they'd embroidered towels for me with Laura written no. on them. Can you, did you save them? I need those. <laughs> I just, it was the most touching thing. So, oh. you know, this was oh. a lot of people who'd probably, you know, never left North Carolina and this kind of thing. And Laura Ashley was coming to visit them. That's oh, all they knew. My God. Well, did, so you helped, you kept it up. I totally kept it Good. up. You <laughs> know, you. I had the English accents. It carried me through. It was fine. <laughs> And I was so fascinated by this place. It was amazing. Anyway, well, it's so, gener generations of people that had worked there. I know. Yeah. And it was, you know, really kind of incredible. And I used to go to Virginia to this mill to do the printing. Mm. Oh, my goodness. It was extraordinary. Okay. Yeah. And so then from Laura Ashley. And so from Laura Ashley, sadly, after Mrs. Ashley died. Not you, but the actual Mrs. The, Ashley. Actually, <laughs> Mrs. Ashley had died. And we, as a company, received all of this money to open all of these stores kind of took the eye off the ball mm. and the DNA started frittering away and it was also a fashion thing because this was in the 90s where suddenly it was all about John Pawson mm -hmm. minimalism <laughs> a little bit of beige a little bit of grey <laughs> you know which was so not the Laura Ashley no. thing so it became tougher and we kept getting people coming in and telling us what we should do and it just got to a point where it was like no no more via an old friend of mine in Paris I was actually hired back in Paris to work for Yves Saint Laurent, who'd also just done one of their public offerings, mm -hmm. and they needed somebody to come in and manage their licenses for accessories. Huh. So I think why they hired me was I had had really good experience with Laura Ashley managing licenses. Right. But suddenly I was doing every single thing that was not a piece of clothing at Saint Laurent. And it was 45 licenses worldwide. Oh, my God. And what was it? It was like it was tie wonderful. clips? I mean, it was, no, like, it was, was everything. It? No, there was multiple. So it was handbags. It was shoes. It was eyewear. It was jewelry. It was hosiery. It was scarves, including it was bed linens. There was towels. But you had a license in Japan. You had a license in Europe. You had – we did have some quite weirdy – things playing cards <laughs> random lacquered bowls in japan um <laughs> you know those were because what had happened was there'd been a point where nearly all the couture houses did this they licensing became a license to print money so they mm -hmm. signed 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 licenses and the licenses picked up the balls 
and ran with them. And the person who did it the best was Pierre Cardin. Well, yeah, I mean, right? best and worst. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I mean, there was really like you he... know, Pierre Cardin loo paper. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, it just kind of went on. <laughs> so one of the things that I was there to do at Saint Laurent was to actually end some of these to licenses buy them back for, yeah. and put much better control over the ones that we had. But where I was really fortunate was this was with Monsieur Saint Laurent and Monsieur Berger. And I spent two and a half years mm. working around this man. And things like the shoes, for instance. So we had our own shoe workshop, which was actually under my office, uh -huh. where we could make a pair of shoes in 24 hours, <laughs> if needs be. But most of the shoes actually came in from Italy uh -huh. and were made by the license. So we, I worked on the shows, whether it was haute couture, whether it was the ready-to-wears. I also, one of my things was to get people in the studio who worked with him working on the things that were the licenses as well. We also had the cosmetics and trying to fold that in and stop that behaving like a completely separate company. It was a very interesting job. It was my job was both the business side of it. I was in charge of the bottom line right. for all of this. And but I also had a studio of designers who worked on nothing but licenses. So it was managing the creative side as well as the business side, uh, uh, making sure all this was really, really, really Saint Laurent oh. kind of thing. What an incredible yeah. experience. They were fun. And then from there? From there, <laughs> uh, from there, went back to London for a short blip, um, <laughs> just because I was going through some personal stuff. And then again was headhunted, this time was to go back to Paris to work for Givenchy mm. with John Galliano oh, at wow. the time. And had you known him? Not really. Mm -hmm. I'd seen, I'd actually at Vogue gone to his final show, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, was either Royal College or St. Martin's. And I remember that there were fish thrown from the runway, <laughs> was his final college show <laughs> or something. And a few landed in people's laps. Oh but he'd gone on from there to be, you know, a total star and was then the first English designer hired by LVMH to come to Givenchy. Yeah. You know, because LVMH had decided they wanted people who were going to make headlines. Mm. So John was the first. And then McQueen. And then McQueen afterwards. Mm. So I was hired to work with John. Um, I insisted on meeting John and that we were all on the same page and da da da. And Again, you were doing accessories for them, sorry. Accessories, you were doing, okay. exactly the same job. My job was to come in the, to do the this, licenses. The licenses, ah. but the difference was with Givenchy, we were buying back all the licenses, right. really bringing it all back in house, back uh -huh. in house, back in house, back in house. Um, but anyway, between the time that it took to hire me, John had moved to Dior. So my very <laughs> first day at Givenchy, <laughs> I was sat down in the president's office, and he said. He went sort of bright red and said, I have something to tell you. And I thought, oh, God, am I fired already? I haven't even started. And he said, John's going to Dior. Do you want to go with him? And I'd been for interviews at Dior, and I went, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. I didn't, there was, yeah. you know, sometimes you get, a, you, go, you get a feeling yeah, just in the hallway. Mm -hmm. So it was not my vibe. And he went, um, okay, great. And he perked <laughs> up a lot. And he said, and I said, well, who's replacing him? He said, we don't know yet, but do you want to help us find him or her? I think it was only him yeah, at the right, stage. It was right, only yeah. a him issue. Um, so do you want, And I went, yeah, absolutely, that would be great. So I worked on one collection with John, which was his final collection, mm -hmm. which was, I don't know, six weeks away. And we started this search for designers and ended up with Alexander McQueen. I think John did the show in October... Lee arrived a week later, and there was an haute couture collection to put together for the month of January. Oh, my God. And he'd never really been to Paris before. <laughs> he suddenly had a whole haute couture house at his disposal. There was that documentary that was done yeah. actually just recently. It's actually really wonderful. Um, they did talk about that first season. They talk about that first season. It was the collection beautiful? I don't remember. It was. It didn't get great reviews yeah. because he was coming off 
doing these really extreme things. I think in the documentary you also see the, I can't remember what it was called, but it took place in the arches in the East uh -huh. End of London with barrels on fire and right, right, cars right, yes. on fire and that kind of thing. Yeah. So there were quite a lot of LVMH executives <laughs> sitting watching that show. Their faces uh. were a picture. <laughs> They'd never quite, this was a little beyond, you know. So Lee comes to Paris and does that first couture. And what he's entranced with is the sort of the coutureness of couture. Right. The and mind. they were wanting Highland Rape or whatever it was. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? One of his shows yeah. where it was all a bit more extreme and a bumpster and a thing. So he put that in. but And so the show didn't get very good reviews. And uh, how long was he at Givenchy? Not many seasons. Oh, yeah. Was a he? while. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a while. I think about three years. Okay. I left before he did. I left because I met my husband ah. at Givenchy. Oh, really? And there was a very strict LVMH oh. rule in place that no thou shalt not date huh. anybody in the same company. They did, actually didn't even like it in the group, but definitely not in the company. Wow. And so did Olivier stay and you went? Yes, huh. exactly. And so, you know, we started going out together. There was also that thing of um, I wanted to have a baby. Yes. <laughs> and he'd also, he was going to gave up on the whole idea. <laughs> and the doctor also said, if you keep doing this, you're not going to kind of thing. Just because the, it's, you know. It's not, no, it's, it, it's the it, most unsupportive business for having a family. And not just that. It was just the hours that you work, yeah. you know. I mean, well, you do 40, it, when you're with the shows, you're doing two nights where you don't sleep right. before the show, you know, late, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. late. It's on and on and on. And for us, the cycle, too, is just you're, you're in Europe two weeks a month, you're in, or, and then you're back, and, I mean, your yeah. body just can't. Yeah. yeah, and I was just not actually <clears throat> physically able to cope with the whole thing. Yeah, So I'm barely. <laughs> <laughs> and so the doctor said, well, mm, okay, if you're having trouble getting pregnant, maybe this is why, so yeah, there we go. Um, and so, yes. That's hard, though, to take a step out of your career. It, it was a relief. wasn't that hard. <laughs> I actually was, um, no, it wasn't, it wasn't so much that it was a relief. It was very much feeling kind of decided about what I wanted to do. Yeah. And actually, I then spent the next six years consulting and working with small brands. And oh. actually, funnily enough, that was when... Um, I already knew Mary Ellen, but I got to know her much better. I actually started a shoe brand um, with a designer called Michel Vivien. Yeah. You know, with that we started that together. Really? Uh, yeah, I didn't absolutely. Know that. Totally. Huh. And his, so the first six years, that was my major occupation, was, you know, getting Michel I going. I love those shoes. Yeah. So, you know, it was all you fun. You always love shoes? Yep. Oh, I love shoes. <laughs> actually, my most... Other than that factory, which was the cotton factory, yeah. which was a factory moment. But the sh factories I love spending the most Italy. time in are shoe factories. And I just, <laughs> there's something about the complexity of the amount of pieces that go to yeah. making up a shoe that I just find amazing. Yes, so shoes, I love, 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 love shoes. <laughs> and I love spending time in shoe factories <laughs> and visiting factories and all of that. And Pierre Hardy's your friend. And Pierre Hardy is a friend. And Bruno and Cresone. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. That's funny. Which is all kind of really fun. Mm. Um, so yeah, I did that and then got headhunted again. And this was to go to New York to work for Ralph Lauren. Mm. And it just so happened that my husband, who was still working in fashion, but funnily enough, he had moved to work for Saint Laurent, but this was new regime right. with Tom, Tom Ford, Ford regime. and that kind of thing. So he never worked with Monsieur Saint Laurent. He worked with Tom Ford and that kind of thing. So it was kind of quite fun. He was getting a bit bored with the job that he was doing and he wanted to move on. They wanted to keep him in the company. And so they said, OK, you can move to New York and do this for Yves Saint Laurent. So we actually managed to move as a whole family mm -hmm to and Tom New York here. and Tom so we got visas for everybody mm. and off we went to New York and Tom went there and it was the most fantastic adventure. How long were y'all there? We were there for just just about two years okay. which was really fantastic. Then what happened was they tried to replace Olivier my husband in Paris it didn't work so they told him he had to come back to <laughs> Paris. 
He then tried the Paris New York commute, which is no. not happening. And so it kind of got to the point where it was marriage or job. <laughs> I'm I, glad went you chose marriage, yeah. I went back to Paris. I went back to Paris. There we go. And so it was in getting back to Paris that I kind of thought to myself, what to do now? Do I go back and do a sort of corporate type job? Who am I going to work for? Who do I want to work for? Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure. And for some bizarre reason, having only done accessories, I mean, seriously, yeah. only, <laughs> only, only done accessories for any of these houses. I got this bee in my bonnet about clothing mm. and thought, I want to do a clothing brand. <laughs> and was it hard to start the brand? It was terrifying. <laughs> it was utterly terrifying. It took me a good year and a half to, to two years to actually build up the guts to mm. actually get to the point where I was making a twirl. Mm. Then I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to do it. And funnily enough, I said... That first 12, I realized that having worked on handbags and shoes, which are so small spaces and mm -hmm. to the millimeter, I could actually make adjustments. And seeing the first garment made from that 12, so it's like, okay, maybe I can begin to do this. But I was still horrified. And <laughs> I'm not horrified. Horrified isn't the word. I was still terrified. terrified and not convinced I could do it. So that very first collection, I actively discouraged people from coming to see it. I mean, actively... <laughs> Really? I know, it was ridiculous. It was uh, so pathetic. <laughs> Collection number two. I mean, you can and imagine. You and we we, were, we were financing this ourselves. So, right. I mean, this was the most insane thing Did ever. Did you just show it in Paris to friends? I just showed it in Paris yeah. to friends to start with. Collection number two. Which I, it's collection number one, thank God, was really tiny. Otherwise, you know, we would have lost our house. You right. know? It was kind of one of those kinds of things. So collection number two, yes, Paris. And it was only going to be Paris. But I was also going to take it to London. Mm -hmm. So I found a place to take, take it to London. This wonderful friend from Chicago um, who lives between London, I mean Paris and Chicago, mm -hmm. came in to see the collection and went, you've got to bring this to, to America. And I went, well... How she said, you're going to set up racks. You're going to show it in my front room, <laughs> and you're going to and it's demi couture. It's fabulous. And I said, I can't call it couture. I've worked for a couture house. She went, it's America. You're going to call it couture. <laughs> <laughs> I loved her. She was so great. Yeah, I love it. Um, yeah. So that was my first thing, and then I thought, well, I'll take it to New York. Also. Having been worked in journalism, I had one or two contacts still, yeah. and they came to see the collection, and they said, "Actually, this is kind of fantastic," mm -hmm. and I got some press, and I got, and that was what kicked the whole thing off. But the fact, I think, it was also the fact that Udibi and I had worked a long time in the business. We had the logistics prepared yes. that picked up that interest that was generated. Right. It was really hard going for the first year and a half really hard to make ends meet yeah you know and all that kind of thing and then it clicked it clicked and people started thinking that oh this is interesting I quite like having something made for me and tailored for me and uh -huh. yes I'll come back and yes well, I'm really say, using this well I think it also it does take almost that second visit like you, it's not mm -hmm. I don't know that it um People have to see the evidence of how much they wear it, and that yes. they're such working clothes. That I they, know, and they work so hard. I know. So that, but that's, <laughs> and then, and then people cannot wait to see you again. I they're know. like, oh my god, I've worn that thing yeah. into the ground. Yeah. I have to replace it. Yeah. So that's the fault with the collection. <laughs> the, on the no, on the whole, it doesn't have huge hanger appeal. It looks amazing. It doesn't on. jump off, you know, a rack at you. It requires somebody to sell it to put it onto somebody. Mm -hmm. Once it on somebody, everybody goes, ooh, what is that? I'll have some of that. Yes, please, I want some. <laughs> but n on the rack, not so much. Well, the other thing I, I love about your collection that, that nobody does this is that you have all sizes. Mm -hmm. And usually when you have a trunk show, everything's a sample size, negative two that's been fitted on a 15-year-old yeah. check model. <laughs> I mean, psychologically, that's hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it hard to really be a grown hard. woman and try that on. And yeah. people, you know, the person will say, well, in production, in your size, it'll be, you know, it'll, the sleeves will go yeah. to here. And, 
but to, I don't. I just. I always really appreciated that about your oh, collection, thank you. and that you feel the clothes feel. They make you feel so good. Thank you. you I'm. They're really special. Okay, thank you. Why, why Davima? I, I know she was. Tell, <laughs> tell me, tell the story. About. Okay. Um, when I first, I was very leery about putting my name on a brand. I think it was that five years a consultant working with small brands. And there were one or two people who had sold parts of their brand to backers. And suddenly they didn't own their name anymore. Mm. And I thought that was the scariest thing yeah. that could possibly Horrifying. happen to anybody. So I knew I didn't want my name to go on it. And I started looking around for a brand. And then you start doing the internet searches for <laughs> what can I do as a dot com. And it, and it becomes <laughs> really, really impossible. And you're dreaming up names and they're all sounding silly. <laughs> and so after a while, I just look up from my desk and I realize, as ever, there is the postcard of Davima with Elephants which was above my desk at WWD. It was above Richard my desk Avedon. at Vogue, which is a photograph by Richard Avedon, which is that beautiful woman standing with her a arms up. And that up, dress. And that dress. That sash. Exactly. <laughs> which, funny enough, was an Yves Saint Laurent dress Saint Laurent. for yeah. Dior. Oh, was it? Yes. Oh, for Dior, I didn't it's know that. It's a Dior dress, oh, but it was the that. collection that oh. Eve did for Dior. Wow. Kind of thing. And I've always loved that photograph. It's always been on my little inspiration board. And I looked up and I suddenly thought, Davima, <laughs> hey, that's kind of a good name. So you quickly do all the internet searches. <laughs> Nobody had it. <laughs> and I could sort of do, and I decided I was going to do Davima Paris because I was based in Paris. That's where I wanted to find work rooms that were in Paris. You know, it's where I lived. So that was how uh, it started. Also, your label is one of the most beautiful labels. Oh, thank you. It's really Thank you, thank you, thank you. But every detail. <laughs> We always ask this question. Do you have proms in, at the Lycée in, in London? Did you have a prom? Is, is that a totally American thing? Um, <laughs> I mean, I know it's totally it's, American. It's a, but prom is a totally American but thing. But have you all taken it? <laughs> I was wearing Laura Ashley. I was too. <laughs> I was, it wasn't, I'm not kidding. It was, it was more this kind of <laughs> sort of debut type thing okay. that was going on. Right, okay. Laura, Laura Ashley. Ashley. Me too, Jane. Oh, good. <laughs> the puffiest sleeves you've ever seen I in your know. life. So tell me, what did, what did it look like? This was, <laughs> yeah, it was a proper Laura Ashley dress with the... Floral? Pit, or Floral. Okay. Of course, floral. Do you know what flowers? <laughs> no. Okay. All I know, it was blue <laughs> with little white flowers on it. Oh. And it had some inset lace uh -huh. and around the wrist. It was... And yeah. what was the bodice like? It I had more of an open kind of neckline. I didn't do was the high. Was it polished cotton? Yes, it was a polished cotton. Yeah. Jeez. Did you bo would you have borrowed your mother's something? No. Earrings? The, yes. I mean, there was... Oh, definitely that. I mean, we had a beautiful family necklace, uh -huh. with sort of earrings. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, got to wear that. That was very exciting. That was, <laughs> that was much more exciting than the than dress. The dress. Actually, much more exciting than the jewelry. You, you have the best jewelry. Oh. You are, well, do you want to retire to my parents' house and go see my Laura Ashley bedroom? I would love to. <laughs> I would love to. I really, really, really would love to. Seriously. Thank you so much for coming. We love you. We love having thank you. Thank you. I love being here. I really do. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. What We Wore is produced by Capital and Balto Creative Media. The original song, Someone So Enchanting, was composed and performed by Britt Drazda. What We Wore is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com.